This afternoon, we're going to continue on our study of great Bible events, and I want to look at Acts chapter 5. And as we look in Acts chapter 5, I want to read about the apostles being released from prison by the angels of the Lord. Now, we can see in this story the struggle between heaven and hell going on here today. Whenever godly men are set about his work, when godly men go to do God's work, they will in no doubt be met by opposition. Satan doesn't like to see people doing God's work. So he's going to do what he can to stand and get in their way. I'm going to look at Acts chapter 5, and we're going to start by reading uh, in verse 17. It says, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. We see here, the priests are angry with these apostles. They're not really happy with what's going on about them preaching and working miracles in the streets of Jerusalem. So they get angry about it, and shut them up in the prison. But we want to ask ourselves, why were they so angry? What made them so upset? Well, here's the problem. If the doctrine of Christ was to take hold and become the norm in Jerusalem, then the people would no longer have any use for these priests. They could see, these priests could see their wealth and their dignity, their power over the people. They could just see it just slipping away as the doctrine of Christ was preached. They thought they had taken care of this issue. They thought when they had put Christ to death, it was a done deal. But it just keeps rearing its ugly head. Here it is again, a thorn in their side. And that makes them upset. It said that the, the priest had the whole sect of the Sadducees to join them in this persecution. Well, why were the Sadducees all upset about it? Well, the Sadducees are all upset because of their, uh, their stance on the spiritual afterlife differed from that of the apostles. You know, my dad used to say it this way. He would tell me that, the, you see, these Sadducees were sad, you see, because they believed not in the resurrection. That's the way I always remember it. The Sadducees are sad because they don't believe in the resurrection. And they also didn't believe in anything of the spiritual world apart from their earthly existence. They didn't believe there was an afterlife. They didn't believe there was a heaven and hell. They believed you came, you lived to earth, you did what you could. And then you were done. You can understand that's a little bit of a sad existence. That's not the existence I want, but that's where they were. We know that it's really not uncommon for those without religion, those that have no religion at all, those that would just deny the existence of God completely, will stand with others against the one true God. So here we see these Sadducees standing with the high priests against the apostles. Now, this group of men witnessed all the to-do surrounding the apostles. They had seen everything that was going on. In the, in the verses preceding what we read, we see the apostles going up and down the streets of Jerusalem. We see the sick being brought in from the countryside. We see all the sick of Jerusalem being put out in the streets. They were just all excited about these apostles. And they even said that they just would put him out in the street in hopes that as Peter passed by, Peter's shadow would pass over them and they would be healed. So here's all this excitement surrounding the apostles. And they were upset about this. The high priests and the Sadducees were upset about the large number of people getting caught up in everything surrounding the apostles' doctrine and their teachings. They couldn't they just couldn't take all that attention being given to somebody else. They were the spiritual elite people. They were the ones who the people were supposed to look to, not these Johnny-come-lately apostles. So they became angry. They became angry first at the apostles for teaching in the name of Christ and for having the audacity to actually heal sick people. 
And that just made them mad. Then they were mad at the people for being stupid enough to get caught up in all that mess that the apostles were offering. And then perhaps maybe they even got a little mad at themselves for not taking care of this stuff already. And they got to the point where they, they just couldn't take it anymore. Oh, what jealousy will drive us to sometimes. So they stooped so low as to lay their hands on them, as the scripture says. Or maybe it was that they sent their officers out to, to grab them and put them in the common prison. So basically they were put in with common criminals, put in with the, the worst of the criminal element, as that would be read. Now they had a purpose in all this. They had a purpose in putting them up in the prison. First of all, they wanted to restrain them from their work. Just a restraint. Now even if they could not charge them criminally with anything, if there wasn't not really anything they could do to, to keep them in prison, or nothing they could do to punish them with beatings or with, um, or they beat them anyways, but even if there was nothing criminally there, they could rightfully beat them or put them to death or keep them in prison, the least they could do is prevent them from continuing to get the people's attention. So we're just going to lock them away from everybody and just kind of stop what's going on right here. The second thing they were trying to do was to, to scare them from their work. You know, the apostles had already been brought in before this council and they had threatened them. They had told them, don't you dare go out and teach in the name of Jesus. But apparently it didn't work because they were still doing it. So now these chief priest says, well, let's try and scare them a little bit more. Let's throw them in the prison. So they throw them in the prison. Hopefully they can make them start to fear that those threats might come to pass. So, okay, maybe the apostles will realize we mean business if we'll throw them in jail and they'll stop preaching in the name of Jesus. Third thing they were trying to do is they wanted to disgrace or discredit their work. You know, if if they could take the apostles and vilify them, make them look like criminals, then perhaps maybe the people wouldn't want to listen to them. You know, it's a societal norm. We don't normally go seek out criminals for religious advice, do we? No. So that's what the high priest was trying to do here. Well, if we can make them into criminals, then maybe the people wouldn't look to them. You know, Satan likes to do that to people. Satan likes to make proclaimers of the gospel out to be ignorant and intolerant, thus discrediting them from the people. You know, when I read this story, though, I think about, I think of, of a baseball game. And, you know, the visiting team in a baseball gets to bat first. And they give it their best shot. But then... The home team gets to step up to the plate. So here, the visiting team, these high priests, they've given it their best shot. Satan's given it his best shot to get these men in prison. But now, God gets to step up. And he gets to show what he's got. If we look in verse 19, it says, But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth. God's given it his best. And I've titled this message, No Prison Strong Enough. No Prison Strong Enough. You know, sometimes do we try and, and put God in a little box. And we say, this is where, where God, not necessarily do we think that this is where he can operate, but we think this is where God will operate in our lives. He's only going to stay in this little box. But God is not constrained to our way of thinking. He's not constrained to our little box that we put him in. He's not constrained to the four walls of these church. He is everywhere and he can do anything. So as you can see here in this set of scripture, God steps up. And there is no prison strong enough to hold back the gospel of Jesus Christ. No prison strong enough. So God sends his angel for two things. First of all, he sends the angel to release these men from prison. You know, we see the apostles get freed. 
The angel of the Lord comes by night, as it says, and he opens the prison doors in spite of any locks, in spite of any bars. He just takes that out of the way and takes care of business. In spite of any of the guards that are standing in the way and watching the doorway, the angel just, as if they're not there, brings the prisoners forth. As we can see, there is no prison so dark, there is no prison so strong that God cannot visit his people in it, and if he pleases, release them from it. The second thing the angel was sent to do was to renew their commission to preach the gospel. As he says in verse 20, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. So the angel made it perfectly clear that when the high priest had given them instructions to teach no more, that that instruction has been nullified by God, and it has been made void from heaven above, and they are to stand and proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. The angel did not release them from prison so that they could flee from those that wished to do them harm, but they were freed from prison so that the work would continue in Jerusalem. So that the name of Jesus Christ could be proclaimed unto the people. That was the purpose of their release. And the angel made it clear to them when he let them out. He said, this is what you're to do. You know, likewise, when we take our petitions to the Lord, when we go to him and we ask for, for respite from our sickness or from our trouble or whatever it might be, we should not take that. When God grants us that petition, we should not... Take that as permission to simply enjoy the comforts of life. But we should be reminded that God has a work for us to do, and God has granted us our petition so that we would not be impeded in that work. God lifts us up our sick beds so that we can get busy about doing His work. You know, David understood this. David said so in Psalms 119, 175. He said, Let my soul live. And it shall praise thee. Make me well, and I will praise you, God. That's the whole purpose of it. And I, I find it a little refreshing. And we should take note here that, that God does, doesn't back away from the fight. He doesn't send his angel to tell the apostles to find a more private or less offensive way of spreading the gospel. No, that's not what he does. He tells them to take it to the center of the matter. He doesn't say go lock yourselves up in a house somewhere with the brethren and, and uh, sh share with those that are likewise. He tells them to go right into the middle of it. To take it where all the action is. Where they get the most attention from the high priest. He said take the gospel right into what the high priest thinks is his home turf. But I hate to tell the high priest the temple is not his home turf. That's God's home turf. God's home turf is the temple. The priests were this just there usurping his authority. But I also find it interesting that they are to preach to the people. You know, the angel doesn't say, uh, go out and find the princes and the rulers and preach to them because God already knows they're not going to really listen. So he says, preach to the people. The people who are, are willing and they have a desire to be taught. They want, they're thirsting for the words of God. And these are souls that are precious to Christ. So God not only tells them where to speak and to whom to speak, but he tells them how to speak. You can notice how the angels tell them to stand and speak in the temple. So they are to speak publicly, they are to speak loudly, they are to speak boldly, and they are to hold nothing back. They are supposed to let it all out. They are to be sure that all can see them, to be sure that all can hear them, to be sure that their actions prove that the message they have to deliver is worth taking notice of. Something that's worth standing up for. Something that is worth both living and dying for. So they are told to, to speak. What, exactly what it says is speak all the words of this life. 
You see, the words of this life. Well, what life is this, this life? Well, this life, this everlasting life, which the Sadducees deny. They deny an everlasting life. Or this life that flows from Christ who, who says he is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, we must never forget that the, the gospel, the gospel really is a matter of life and death. It really is. And we need to treat it as it is. We need to preach it like it is. And those that hear it must take it to heart and hold on to it like it is a matter of life and death. But it says, not only that, I like the way it says they are to speak all the words. They should leave none of it out. Don't, don't just preach what the people want to hear. Don't just give them itching ears. Don't just tickle their itching ears. Don't change your message at all. We, we can't neglect the heavier parts. You know, sometimes we come and we hear a message that steps on our toes, that burdens us and makes us feel changed. It makes us feel like we need to change something. But God says we're to preach all the words. We don't just leave out the parts that make us uncomfortable. We need to hear those words preached to us as well. We can't fear offense in the word of life because they are God's words. They're God's words. So if anyone takes offense to the words that are preached out of the Bible, then they, they take offense at God. They're not taking offense at me. They're not taking offense at the preacher. They're taking offense at God because these are God's words. Now, once the apostles received their instructions, they immediately went to work. They didn't, they didn't mince any words. Angel says, do it. They said, okay, here we go. Verse 21 says, And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. Angel says, go do it. So they said, okay, here we go. First thing in the morning, the minute the gates were open, as people started coming in and out, there they were, right there, preaching the gospel. You know, early on when Christ was still on the earth and the apostles were sent out to preach the gospel, you know, they had been told... If they went into a city and that city rejected the message, then they were just simply to flee into another city. But now, that instruction has been taken away from the, by this angel. This angel says, I don't care that these people are rejecting your message. You're to stay put. You're to teach in the temple. You're to let the house of God, this temple, be the sounding board for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they happily went about their task without any delay. They went to it, exactly what they were told to do. No fear of what's going to come next. No fear of what might befall them. They were trusting fully in the Lord that whatever it is that He asks, whatever God asks them to do, He's going to provide a way for it to be accomplished. So, as we continue to read the story, I kind of find what happens next to be slightly comical. It's a little bit funny in my regards, looking at the high priests. Because the high priest and, and his party continue on their quest to try and prosecute and persecute these apostles. So we look at the second part of verse 21. It says, But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. They thought they had their apostles right where they wanted them. They, hot, they thought they had them caught. They thought they had... Caught the fox in the hen house. They thought they could bring together all the powers of Israel to bear against these men. You see, it says that they, they called all the eldership, that is, all three courts, all the benches of judges in all of Jerusalem. That would be 116 judges in total gathered at this council to come against the apostles. And we see God orchestrating it in such a way that these events would take place this way, that the apostles' testimony against the rulers of Jerusalem would be as public and as complete as possible. Now with all the judges convened, some, some of these judges may have never heard the gospel preached if it weren't for them being gathered into this place called by the high priest. So they were all now going to be exposed 
to the truth. Now the high priest thought it was to his advantage to call all these people around, but it was ultimately to God's advantage and to the apostles' advantage. He thought he had, the high priest thought he had the opportunity to, you know, as, as Barney Fife would say, to, to nip it in the bud. That's what the high priest had in mind here. He was just going to nip this problem in the bud. But God has a way of turning things around on the old devil, old Satan. If Satan tries to work something out, generally when Satan's out there doing his best, God just flips it around on him. He says, thank you, Satan, for lining things up for me just the way I needed them to go. And that's what we have here. And we can only imagine the disappointment on the high priest's face. You can imagine as he gathers all these judges together, gathers all these people in his chambers to have this, this grand court. You know, surely he's given some great speech. He's given some great oration about the, the dangerous men that we have in custody and how they're threatening our way of Judaism and we need to do something about it. And surely he had spoken on what measures they had to, that must be taken to rid Jerusalem of this doctrine of Jesus Christ. So... Here he has them all gathered, and once he has them all together, then he sends an officer to fetch the prisoners. Sends the officer out. In verse 22 it says, But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Imagine yourself one of these captains of the guards and you're sent to go fetch these prisoners. You're sent to go fetch the apostles and you get there and you find the prison doors are all closed. The locks are all as they should be. You find that the prison guards are, are standing watch outside just where they should be. You find no evidence of any forceful entry. You find no evidence of any forceful exit. All the common prisoners, the normal criminals, were right where, they were, where you had left them. You find no tunnels dug, no bars loose or removed, no mortar being scraped away. All is exactly as you expect the prison to be, except for one small detail. Where are the apostles? Where did they go? You can just imagine the confusion that spread around this court when the officers returned with the news. In verse 24, it said, Now when the high priests and the captains of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them where unto this would grow. There was doubt about where this news would grow. We have a very confused group of individuals here. A group most likely never so disappointed in their lives. They thought they were again able, going to be able to shut down this business of Jesus Christ. But what they must, you can imagine what they must have thought. Well, maybe the guards had been in cahoots with the masses of people that had been following these apostles. Or Perhaps the apostles used some kind of dark magical forces to release themselves from prison. Or they might have wondered, would, would word of this miraculous escape endear the people that much more to them? Or would the apostles, being escaped, would they maybe flee Jerusalem only to be heard to stir up this trouble about Jesus in some other city where this court would not have as long of an arm to reach them and stop it as they would here in Jerusalem. Perhaps they now felt that they had even worsened their condition. You know, we can take to heart in knowing that those that seek to diminish the work of Christ will only diminish themselves. But their confusion and embarrassment doesn't even stop here. As it goes on in verse 25, it says, Then came one and told them, saying, Behold the men whom ye put in prison. They're standing in the temple and preaching to the people. The very people they were discussing, the very people they were confused about, wondering what's going to happen with, they're found in the temple doing the exact thing that this court wanted to prevent. 
It's as if the apostles were thumbing their nose at the high priest. The very thing that got them thrown in prison, they were doing it again. And they were doing it right under the high priest's nose. In the very place that the high priest claimed as his own. Now, you know, usually when a prisoner escapes, he tries to put as much distance between himself and the authorities that put him in prison as possible. But not these men. These escapees are showing their faces exactly where the authorities have the most influence and power. So this boldness perhaps gave the court the most trouble and confusion of all, that they were so boldly where they were. So the apostles are then taken a second time. In verse 26 it says, Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. I kind of find it interesting where it's, that it, it makes a point to say that they brought them without violence. You know, you think about it, but it, and it tells us there wh why they did it without violence, which kind of rubs me the wrong way. It, it had nothing to do with the fact that they wanted to reverence the temple. It had nothing to do with the fact that they, were, they had feared the apostles, who just a chapter back had pretty much struck down Ananias for lying to them. They weren't afraid of that, but simply because they feared the people. Which it all points back to the motivation of the high priest. Which their whole motivation for everything they did was to be lifted up in the eyes of the people. And even though they brought them without violence though, they brought them to the people that wished to do them the most violence. Verse 27 says, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us? Basically, they were being now being charged with ignoring the order of the court. You know, we might call that contempt of court today. The apostles had shown an unwillingness to submit to the power of the Sanhedrin court. We find it not uncommon, though, for human governments that most stray from God's authority to insist the most upon their authority and impose the most strict laws. You know, you look at what possible form of government could be farther from God's will than communism or Sharia law. Those forms of government are the strictest and the most insistent upon the people following their rules. So here we see these gentlemen straying from that, from God's authority, insisting that these men listen to what they have to say. But we also see that this court couldn't even stand to have their deeds brought back up again. How, how dare the apostles remind the people of the shedding of the innocent blood of Jesus Christ? How dare they suggest that it was improperly done? How dare they stir the people against the court and against the Roman government for its involvement of the crucifixion of Christ? Did the apostles not understand this great disturbance of the peace they were bringing upon Jerusalem by bringing back up all these events that had just taken place? This court says, you're trying to put that blood on us. We, we want to just wash our hands of it and be done with it. We want it to just hush it up and put it down and we'll bury it and sweep it under the rug. That's what they wanted. They didn't want all these events laid at their doorstep. They didn't want to talk about the events of the past. Now, they weren't very shy when they committed the acts, but they didn't wish to have them repeated over and over again in the ears of the public. The more scrutiny that were put upon their actions, the more fault that was going to be found with it. So they didn't want it discussed. Now, we see Peter in this case, responds exactly the same way he did the first time he was before this court. It wasn't the entire court the last time he was there, but he responds the exact same way. In verse 29, it says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. 
And that's the real lesson in this for us. That's the thing that's most important for us to remember here. Men would have us to follow all manner of false doctrine. That's what men would have us to do. Men would have us to work our way into heaven, just as the great court would rule over Israel by placing them under a burden of works. That's what man would have us to do. Man would have us to believe all manner of falsehoods concerning, first of all, this world, falsehoods concerning God, falsehoods concerning the Bible, and all manner of doctrine. But we have our authority. We have the word of God by which we must live. So we can obey God rather than men, as Peter says. And we should let that be our goal. As we go about our daily lives, as we walk out the doors of this church, and as we enter into the community, our goal should be to obey God rather than men. Yeah. How are we going to do that? Well, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we have to first... To, to, to know how to obey God, we have to do it by studying His Word. When we study His words, then we can put them into practice. We have to put them into practice. Study God's Word, know what they are, and then obey God and not man. And that's what we need to do as we depart today. Let's stand, let's be dismissed in a word of prayer.